because everybody gets this wrong and it, it pisses me off because it's the number one lesson in investing. Will they double? Can they double? Well, do we want a good company at a bad price? What's a good company? Well, we just said Berkshire Hathaway, right? What if Berkshire Hathaway stock market cap was $10 trillion? Every asset you'll ever look at, there's a right price and a wrong price. And it's an investor's job to determine the two. Good company, bad company, you have to look at one thing when you look through these documents. You can see that I'm pretty patient and I go through them slowly. But you have to look at one thing, right? It's this net cash provided by operating activities. Maybe I'll finally start teaching you guys something. Let's look at this together. Salesforce.com is such a weird company. It's kind of one of these companies where you may have heard of them, but you don't know much about them unless you use their product at work. So $7.8 billion dollars. Last quarter, um, six point eight billion a year ago. Um, that is what twelve percent? No, no, wait, wait, twenty percent growth, fifteen percent, fourteen percent, whatever. A lot. That's good growth, but uh, you have to strip out acquisitions. So maybe I think they maybe maybe had an acquisition that boosted. Earnings. I think Slack probably lapped year over year. Maybe I'll finally start teaching you guys something. Let's look at this together. I, I feel like I'm not doing much education lately. This is Salesforce.com. This is their income statement, one of the three main financial statements, right? Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. Here, in their income statement, which looked normal to me, Revenue, cost of goods, gross profit, bunch of costs here. Which one of you people is smart enough to answer this question? They have a gains on strategic investments line. Do you see that? Gains on strategic investments. Is that a one-time gain or something that's going to recur frequently? So when we model it, do we include it in our model? Or do we... Excluded. It's obviously a one is funny. It's obviously a one-time gain that we can't really forecast accurately. They might lose money on strategic investment. Right? It's not really part of their income. Why would we think about this as part of their business? It's not part of their business. Their business is selling software, not making investments. So if we're trying to forecast their business operations, this has nothing to do with their business. Yeah, if, if it's not a part of their business, then I, I don't think that we should be forecasting it or including it in, in the business. That's kind of a crazy, crazy thing to do. You know, we're trying to get a sense for their business operations that are repeatable, recurring, not, you know, this one-off investment that they made. And they could be making a lot of one-off investments, but it's still not something that, uh, let's say they were going to get acquired, something that an acquirer would pay for, because maybe the acquirer won't be doing those investments anymore, right? It's very dependent on a lot of things that are outside of the company's control. Now, it doesn't mean we can't kind of give the company credit for if it can repeatedly make great investments, which by the way, we're not sure, sure Salesforce can do that. It's uh, not clear at all, in fact. So on a gap basis, Salesforce isn't so profitable, but I think on a, on a cash flow basis, they are pretty profitable. And part of it is, I'm guessing, stock-based compensation, which there was a recent essay a lot of people have claimed is pretty good about how stock-based comp is sort of obscuring a lot of what's going on in Silicon Valley. Lock-in is generally real in software. All right, so there's the cash flow. You can even see pretty substantial seasonal cash flow. Here's CapEx. And I think we'll leave the income statement at that, and let's go grab last quarter, too. Looks like they had some decent growth this quarter. But I wonder, again, if it was organic or acquisition-driven. It's kind of the slowest Salesforce ever grew, probably. No, nah, probably not, but whatever. Yeah, if I were them, I'd keep a billion shares outstanding. That's kind of a cool number. Keep it frozen at a billion. It's always hard to memorize how many shares outstanding a company has. But if you're really lit, you really know investing, you know all the companies in your portfolio, you know how many shares outstanding they have. That's when you you know you're on top of things. I used to say that um, 
Some people can tell you the batting average of every New York Yankees player. I can tell you the S&P 500 earnings estimates for every S&P 500 constituent. That's what I used to say to like mic drop interviews and stuff like that. All right, here's another quarter of cash flow. So it looks like they have a big bolus cash flow in Q1. I don't quite understand why. Um, maybe somebody out there does. Um, a little weird, to be honest. They do a three month and a six month, which is nice because a lot of companies just do the six month or 12 month, which is really archaic and annoying. Um, all right, so negative free, not negative free cash flow, but basically break even free cash flow for two quarters. But again, it doesn't kind of matter if they have this one big bolus quarter every year, which it sounds like they do. So let's go grab that and see what's up with this very weird seasonality in their business where Q1 is like this massive cash flow quarter. And it's not a massive net income quarter, as you can see. Maybe they just collect their bills. I mean, honestly, that that's not unreasonable. Yeah, there it is, accounts receivable. It just basically every January, February, they basically say, hey, you gotta pay up. <laughs> yeah, on those yearly contracts or something. Kind of weird that the, you gotta pay your yearly contract in the April quarter. So February, March, and April. Notice the stock-based comp quite a lot. Okay, so I don't know what Q4 looks like. Maybe they also collect bills then. So let's see if we can't get uh, their 10Q. I'm sorry, their 10K. And here's the 10K for Salesforce. We should probably read this in detail anyway. So if you want to read salesforce.com's 10K, pretty good um, read. You can always get these documents on sec.gov. Really a lot more detail than the 10Q. We aspire to have 50% of our workforce made up from underrepresented groups, which we define as women, black, Latinx, indigenous, multiracial, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, people with disabilities and veterans. And they reached that. Good for them. I mean, you know, revenue is maybe more important than that metric, but that metric's important too. I like that. I know some of you guys are laughing, but to me, I do like uh, watching some of those upper underrepresented people get big wins, make millions of dollars. It's a prestigious company. That opportunity should be available to everyone. Trying to get a sense for the business over time, and we should be able to do that pretty easily here um, in a second as we churn through a couple of years of their income statement. So we set up a couple of quarters, now we're gonna set up a couple of years. And we just noticed right away that revenue growth has been pretty robust. 24% revenue growth, 25% revenue growth. And let's see what they'll do for this year. Um, so Salesforce, uh, they probably gave guidance. I kind of want to look at their guidance before I forecast the, the January quarter here. All right, here's the company official press release, which probably if you had to do one thing is, is to read every company's official press release. Here's the guidance. All right, let's see. Revenue of around eight billion. Okay, so let's see here. Seventy four hundred and six hundred. Seventy three hundred and seven hundred. Let's try that. All right, eight billion. That's nine percent revenue growth. Wow. So Salesforce growth is is slowing to a crawl. Full year guidance of roughly 31 billion, which is what we have here. And there's uh, the revenue growth. Again, this includes Slack. So they were kind of slowing before Slack is my guess. And now with Slack, they basically, Slack having been lapped. But yeah, pretty amazing growth if you can see from 10 billion to 30 billion, kind of measured, you know, no, I mean, this is massive growth to be fair, but you know, consistent. The big question is Salesforce growth stopping or slowing. Um, let's look at, all right, let's look at the cash flow every year. If you had to look at one thing when you look through these documents, you can see that I'm pretty patient and I go through them slowly. But you have to look at one thing, right? It's this net cash provided by operating activities. Four billion in 2020, five billion in 2021, six billion in 2022, right? That is really their business. 
right? The income statement has so much stuff going on in it that it's basically useless, right? If you look at the income statement, the net income is just whatever. It's just a big blah. Half the net income is coming from a tax rebate, like whatever, right? Um, the only thing in the income statement you can really look at is revenue in the case of Salesforce. So many accounting tricks. No, cash flow is going up, right? So this is 2020. It reads from chronologically from left to right. So 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion. So pretty good uh, growth. But remember, there's no such thing as an asset that's unmoored from its price. Every asset you'll ever look at, there's a right price and a wrong price. And it's an investor's job to determine the two. Good company, bad company. Let me, let me really drill this home because everybody gets this wrong and it, it pisses me off because it's the number one lesson in investing. You know, there's a two by two matrix. Good company, bad company. Good price, bad price. What are you looking for in investing? What are you looking for? Which boxes? Good company, bad company, good price, bad price. So this box is good company, good price. Well, that seems pretty obvious, right? We want that. Maybe Berkshire Hathaway or something like that. All right. Bad company, bad price. Maybe like an Enron or FTX. Obviously, we don't want that, right? No go. What about these two? This one's tricky. Do we want a good company at a bad price? What's a good company? Well, we just said Berkshire Hathaway, right? What if Berkshire Hathaway stock market cap was $10 trillion? That's a bad price. Right now, the price is 5% of that, right? 95% off. So why would you pay 20 times what it costs in the stock market right now? That'd be a bad price. I don't want that. Okay, well, let's pick a bad company. What's a bad company? A company with deteriorating fundamentals. I think AT&T is a good example of a bad company, right? AT&T, Verizon, all the telecom companies. Or how about all the old media companies like Paramount or Viacom or even Disney? Like some of these companies are really going to get disintermediated by social media. What else is a bad company? Probably Snapchat right now is struggling. What else? What's a bad company that you wouldn't want to be in a newspaper company? Maybe Gannett, Best Buy, bad company, GameStop is definitely a bad company. Yeah, these are companies with bad fundamentals, right? But if you got them at a really good price, if somebody said, I'll sell you Best Buy for $1 million right now, you know the market cap is in the billions, you're going to take it. You're going to say this is the greatest opportunity of a lifetime. You're going to sell it to private equity as fast as possible, right? So all we really care about is are we getting a good price? It kind of doesn't matter if it's a good company or bad company. It kind of doesn't matter if cash flow is going up or down, right? We just have to put it into our calculator and determine is the price we're getting good? Is on a scale of value, on a scale of value, wherever the value hits, right? That should be, this is sort of like the barrier, right? This is the most we'll ever pay. And if we can get the stock at this price, we'll buy it, right? And if we get the stock at this price, we don't want to buy it. We want to short it. So we just have to figure out, okay, what's the value that I can get my hands on? And sometimes that's easy. Sometimes that's hard. Um, for Salesforce, this company's making $6 billion, made $6 billion last year. Probably this year, they'll make $7 billion. Is that worth $138 billion? Well, if they made $7 billion every year, it would take you 20 years to get your money back. That's pretty good, actually, because if the earnings are growing rapidly, and rapidly doesn't have to be as rapid as you might think. Um, for example, let's let's uh, let's assume this year seven billion. This free cash flow is growing faster than that. 25, 11. So I'd say it grows 17 percent. And they have a lot of costs they can cut, right? So let's assume let's call this growth rate right here. Okay. Let's assume they can grow 8% a year for, say, 15 years. Maybe say 10 years, just 10 years. Okay. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
nine, ten. All right, and after that, uh, they just grow one percent. How about that? And they're a top software sale software company, so it kind of makes sense. All right, now we're gonna pick a discount rate. Um, I'm going to eight percent. Now we take the net present value, so we discount every cash flow. And in fact, we should stretch this out even further, just to make sure. All right, so we get 164 billion. You know what's amazing? That's almost exactly the stock price. Every time we do one of these things, we get a stock that's fairly valued. Why? The market's pretty efficient. You know, there's there's not a lot of bargains out there. Everybody's doing the same work we're doing. And even though you would think something like a stock price is totally random, here it is. I did some calculations and I got um, this number. And I want to update the balance sheet because the number's a little bit better than that. Um, the current stock price, so maybe Salesforce is a little cheap. They have around seven billion in, in cash in the bank net. So I'm going to add that as well because you that is part of the company. All right, so I get 170 billion, which per share is 171 dollars. The current stock price is 146. Is that enough of a bargain for us to take action and buy the stock? <clears throat> Probably not. That's only 16 percent. You know, it's basically useless. You know, it would have to be a double or something like that for me to be interested. Um, will they double? Can they double? Well, if we assume they're going to grow 8% for 10 years, to be worth a double, they would probably have to grow, what do you guys guess, 10%, 12%? Do you want to do the math? With this model, all I have to do is punch in a number, right? I can just punch in a number. Let me punch in 9%. If they grow 9%, oh, okay, well, then the stock's worth 183. If they grow 10%, okay, the stock's worth closer to like 200. If they grow cash flow 11% a year, all right, now we're talking 211. If they grow cash flow 12%, now we're talking about a stock maybe worth buying. It's 225. If they grow cash 15%, okay, now we're talking about a double. And you might say, Martin, they were they were growing cash, 15%. Look, 11, 25, 17, I think that averages out to roughly 15%. So why won't they keep growing cash at 15%? Well, the revenue growth has slowed down, right? All the way down to 9%. And the stock market is valid, can do these calculations too. And the stock market is kind of valuing it like it's going to grow, quite frankly, more like 7% a year. So the stock market's not stupid. If they, it was obvious they were going to grow 15%, the stock would be at 300. But it seems to be coming more and more obvious that the growth will slow down. So that's kind of why the stock is where it's at. You know, people are starting to get skeptical of like, hmm, I don't know if Salesforce can grow 20% every year. Now, if in this next quarter, they say that next year, in fiscal year 23, we're going to grow or I should say fiscal year 24, we're going to grow revenue by 15%, then the stock will rally tremendously. And that's why tech stocks are so volatile. It's because everyone's trying to figure out this. What is the long-term growth rate of earnings? You know, things like interest rates and stuff like that that you guys are asking about, they do impact the discount rate. But if I use the same discount rate for Microsoft and for Oracle and for other software companies, then it doesn't really change the way I look at the discount rate for, for, uh, for Salesforce. You know, it doesn't matter, right? So, you know, it's pretty much irrelevant. If I use the same discount rate, you know, interest rates impact all the companies kind of pretty similarly. So as long as I keep the discount rate kind of similar across all the companies, and it doesn't make much of a difference. So I can put the NPV here, and you can see for Amazon, I use 8% discount rate as well, but I get a stock price that's double. So Amazon seems a lot cheaper, right? And I have a plus one terminal, and I have... Well, I don't have ROIC for Salesforce, which maybe makes it a little undervalued. But regardless, it looks like I'm using kind of the same framework, and it looks like Salesforce is a lot cheaper than Amazon. So I'm just going to upload this model. You can get all these models on my GitHub totally for free. I'm never going to charge you guys for anything. I don't need to do that. 
uh, repo is github.com forward slash martin scrully.